if you have serious concerns about this country, whatever they may be, politically, economically, morally, whatever, would you raise your hand? Thank you. If you have serious concerns about the church, a local church, a specific church, this church, or the church in a universal sense, in whatever they may be, whether we specifically get our calling or are about the Lord's work or whatever it is, if you have any concern about the church, would you be bold enough to just let me see? Okay. If you have a serious concern about a specific person, someone whom you know or love, and what's going on in their life, would you raise your hand? Thank you. If you raised your hand to any one of those three questions, then I'm glad you're here today. Because the lesson that our sermon series that parallels our monthly Bible reading at home, the lesson that this series has brought us to today will be about a man who had similar concerns. And what God does to him in an eye-opening scene draws him closer to God and therefore motivates him to get his life in order so that he in turn will volunteer to go out into the world and be salt and light and make a difference one person at a time which will ultimately affect his nation. And so let's open our Bibles today to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. For all of you who are visiting, this year we've been studying through the Bible looking for God and what He's like and what He's doing to restore things on earth as they are in heaven. We're looking for what God's like and what God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do as we join Him in the work that He is doing and wants done so that He can be glorified, the name of His Son can be known, and lives can be transformed and everyone can then live abundantly and eternally. And here on this side of the veil. Everyone can have the peace that passes all understanding that can guard our hearts and our lives. And we all can live at peace and harmony with each other. And as that happens between neighbors and states and in our country, then it can happen throughout the world. So for the last five weeks, we studied through the five wisdom literature books, beginning with Job and last week ending with the Song of Songs. And that brings us today to the next section in God's Word that takes us back to what's going on in the nation of Israel and the lives of God's people. Specifically, the next 16 books will bear the name of a prophet who will be both a prayer warrior and a bold spokesman for God, trying to reach the hearts of the people he loves and turn back their lives and then therefore their country back to God and the causes that are closest to the heart of God. And if they do not get it, then listen closely, God will bring them to their knees. Here's the background of what's going on. After 120 years of unity, the kingdom of Israel divided after the death of King Solomon. His son Rehoboam would not listen to the wise counsel of his elders or the voice of his people. So ten of the twelve tribes of Israel revolted. And both kingdoms began to go downhill quickly. And that includes a rapid moral decline. The northern kingdom will have 20 kings, and none of them will be in tune with God, nor will they walk humbly with their God. The southern kingdom will also have 20 kings, and only a handful of them will listen to the voice of God and be godly people. Eventually, both kingdoms will fall. Why? There are three reasons. Both kingdoms will become apathetic to God, 
and they'll become apathetic to the plight of the poor. Let me pause here and say this, apathy is a killer. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a marriage, a family, a church, a country, a sports team, an organization, or a ministry. Apathy is a killer. And these people were apathetic toward God and apathetic to the cries of the underserved and the hurting around them. Secondly, instead of looking upward and outward, both kingdoms turn inward and start living self-centered lives. And you can mark it down when that happens things will quickly spiral out of control. Thirdly, people in both kingdoms were just going through the motions religiously. And not only does that break God's heart, but that too becomes a contributing factor to the decline of the nation and the decline of families. So in the book that we'll study this morning, We'll see these things happening. It's named for the 8th century prophet Isaiah, who preached to the southern kingdom of Judah for 50 years, covering the rain, rain, verse 1 says, of four kings of Judah, King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He was a contemporary of three other preachers and prophets, Amos and Hosea, whom we'll later study. Both of those men were godly men who preached to the northern kingdom, and he also overlaps the preaching of Micah, that godly man who made the statement that has become one of the signature verses of the Cross Point Church of Christ here. He's shown thee, O man, what's good and what the Lord requires of thee to do justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. That's the kind of preaching that God's people are hearing. And yet... In our text that we'll read this morning, in their, in Isaiah's own words, Isaiah lives among a people of unclean lips, and they just don't get it. And therefore, their nation is godless and in a state of moral decay. Does that sound familiar? Isaiah's name means the Lord saves. Right here in the midst of apathy and moral decay, our God raises up a man whose very name sends a message that God cares, that God loves, that God is with on His throne with outstretched arms, wanting prodigal and penitent people to turn their hearts to Him and come to Him. That He's offering salvation and redemption and forgiveness and grace to all who are thirsty. Sadly, the people of Judah weren't spiritually thirsty, and their hearts had grown cold. So God raises up and commissions a man whose very name means the Lord saves to boldly speak the truth to Judah. And in a plain and straightforward way, he does that. He tells them the cause, the root cause of their problems. And he tells them what they must do to revive their nation and their lives. And if they don't get it, or if they stubbornly refuse to surrender their pride and listen to the voice of God, they'll suffer the consequences and they will fall. And sadly, I'll let you in on the end of the story, they both do. But it doesn't stop Isaiah from preaching. And Isaiah challenges his people to quit looking at themselves. Instead, of, instead, lift up their eyes and broaden their perspective and start looking for God and looking at how they can help other people in His name. Ultimately, in chapter 3, Isaiah will broaden their thinking even more. And he'll start pointing them to Jesus to the Messiah, to the Savior, to the Redeemer and friend, to the one who was and is and is to come. Tradition says that Isaiah will be martyred for his life, faith, and preaching. 
Tradition says that he'll be martyred during the reign of the brutal and evil King Manasseh, who we're told about in the book of 2 Kings. And that book says that he did many detestable things. The story is that that king hated Isaiah and what he was saying so much that he put a bounty out on the life of Isaiah. And so Isaiah was hiding out. Tradition says in the hollow of a huge tree. And when the king's soldiers found him, they sent word to the evil king, what do we do with him? And the king sent word back, you saw the tree in two. And tradition says that Isaiah in the hollow of that tree was sawed literally in two. And I don't mean decapitated, I mean his body severed from each other. And there are some scholars who believe that that reference in Hebrews 11, in that great Hall of Faith fame chapter of men and women who live faithfully to God and to their calling, after a long list of them, do you remember what the writer said? What more shall I say about these things? There were people who I don't have the time to tell you, who were stoned, and listen to this line, Hebrews 11, 37, and they were sawed in two and put to death by the sword and put sheepskins around and hunted down like wild animals. And then the writer said, the world is not worthy of people who live like that in their faith. And there are some people who believe that reference in Hebrews 11 is a reference to Isaiah. That's interesting, isn't it? And what a faith-filled man who was faithful to death and who therefore will receive the crown of life. So before we jump into the text, would you bow with me as we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, we praise you for being the God from before there was time. And we praise you for being unchangeable and unmovable and gracious and loving, forgiving. That's who you are. Help our hearts to be in tune with yours. Help our hearts to beat loudly for the causes and the people that are dearest to your heart. And as your word says, help us as your people to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our ways. And we claim the promise that you'll hear from heaven, forgive and heal our land and our lives. Help us as a local congregation. And help us as individuals to see you like Isaiah saw you. And therefore, help our view of you to motivate us to volunteer to go wherever you send and wherever you need your people to go so we can serve in your name and be salt and light in a dark world that desperately needs hope and love and desperately needs to see Jesus living in someone. Please give me the gift of preaching this morning and open both our eyes and hearts to your word. It's in the name of your Son and our Savior that we pray. Amen. The book of Isaiah opens with a summons by God to heaven and earth to listen to the universal truth that needs to be proclaimed. This call is not to just Judah, but it is to every nation and every person who will live from this time forward, and that includes us. God, through Isaiah, is about to share a universal truth that applies to all people for all times. So what's the truth? What's the message? Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his master and the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. What God is saying through Isaiah is this. The children, his children whom he loves and raised and provided for and cared for. They've rebelled and turned their backs against him. And now they are living instead of for him. And instead of living by the two greatest commands, they're living all for themselves. And that, I believe, is the main problem in the world today. There are a number of legitimate concerns that we all have. But I believe it all boils down 
to selfishness and self-sufficiency. And God here says, listen closely, even the animals know better than that. He says, even the animals know that there's always somebody who's greater than them. And yet God's children in Judah don't get it. That's the problem that confronts Isaiah. Why is it that God's children are blind to the will and word of God and the goodness and mercy of their loving Father in heaven? His heart's breaking because of it. Isaiah's struggling with it. Why? That's what we'll explore here. So what God does before we get to that answer in verses 4 through and following through the rest of the chapter is God issues a seven-fold indictment against their nation and their life. And you can go home and read it. What's it going to take to open their eyes and prick their hearts and motivate them to get out of themselves and give up their selfishness and join God in what He's doing and what He wants done in this world? And taking a famous line from the fabulous play, The Man of La Mancha, what will it take to light a fire in God's people so that God's people, that's us, will be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause? The answer is found in chapter 6. So would you turn there with me, please, and then we'll come back to chapter 1. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphs, each one with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lip. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Here's our lesson this morning. Whether we're talking about reviving a nation, a church, a ministry, a marriage, a family, or a life. Revival begins when we see God. And I do not believe it will ever occur until we do. I believe that everything that a nation, a church, a family tries to do to make things better is simply treating a symptom if it's not rooted in a vision of God and who God is and what God wants for us. Everything's just window dressing. If it doesn't spring forth from the agenda that God has for heaven and for earth to be one. And for all things on earth to be like it is in heaven. Revival begins when we see God. And secondly, that allows us then to see ourselves for what and whom we really are and therefore for what we really need. And then it motivates us to go into the world that we live in and make a difference. When Isaiah was given this blessed privilege, like John the Revelator later will be given, when Isaiah is given this privilege to see into the throne room of God, it changed him. It changed him. Why? Because he sees seven glimpses of God. Here they are from verse 1. What does he see? He sees that God is alive. 
King Uzziah is dead, but God is not. Moses said in Psalms 90, Before the mountains were formed and the earth and the world was brought into being, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You're God alone. God was God when Pharaoh thought he was. God was God when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon thought he was. God was God during the dark ages when people didn't think he was. God was God when William Bradford became governor of the Plymouth Colony and tried to birth a new nation of which we now live. God was God when Lincoln was shot, McKinley and Garfield, both Kennedys and Martin Luther King was shot. And regardless of what's going on in the world around us right now, God's still alive. Time Magazine in 66 can declare him dead. Uh, King Isaiah is dead, but God's alive. And when we see that and know that, it puts our concerns in its proper perspective. Oh, we still have them. But we know who is on the throne. And therefore, we sing, we will have no other gods before you. And that's the second glimpse of God that he saw. He sees that he's alive. Secondly, he sees he is on his throne. His country may be falling apart, but listen closely, his God is not. Your family might be falling apart, but listen, your God's not. Your life may be falling apart, but listen closely, your God's not. Your ministry that you're involved in may be falling apart, but listen closely, your God's not. And Isaiah sees that. He sees his God's alive. He sees his God's on the throne. And thirdly, he sees it is his God who is high and lifted up. He's the one that everything is bowing down to and exalting. The train of His robe fills the temple. I think the longest train on the bride that I've ever seen was Princess Diana. It went, looked like it went from London to America. I don't know. But the train of this robe fills the entirety of the temple. And that robe of, or that train of Princess Diana was nothing compared to this one. We just sang this morning the splendor of a king. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light and the darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Isaiah sees that. And fourthly, he sees God in his beauty. We sang this morning, you're beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing's ever seen or heard who can grasp your infinite wisdom, who can fathom the depth of your love, your beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And that's when we all stood. And we bow down. And we lay our crowns down. That's the God that Isaiah sees next that's worshipped and praised. The angelic creatures are flying and hovering and buzzing and darting around faster than the Blue Angel flight team here. They don't feel worthy, even though they're angels. They don't feel worthy. But they're being used. And what are they singing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. I thought Israel was corrupt. They are. I thought that the earth is groaning. Romans 8 says it is. But it's all how you look at it, isn't it? Because Psalms 19 says everywhere you look, God's crying out to us. And He's calling us. And He's declaring His glory. If we'll just open our eyes and look and open our hearts and be receptive to Him. When Isaiah saw the Lord for who He really was, high and lifted up and glorious, it humbled him. And it motivated him to step up and volunteer and answer the call. Who am I going to send out into this world? Who's going to go, God asked, the heavens and represent us? And Isaiah says, 
here am I, send me. He knows he's a man of unclean lips. He knows like the seraphs he's not worthy to be used. But God cleanses him. And God on His throne is opening up His heart and His hands to you regardless of what you've been, how out of service you've been, how far away you've been, how far you've fallen. With outstretched arms, he's opening up his heart and his hands and he's saying, I want to redeem you. I want you to come home. And I want to use you. And after Isaiah allows that to occur and humbles himself and bows before the throne and receives God's grace and mercy, he then goes into a land of unclean lips and he helps them to get a vision of what God wants for them. We'll close today with turning back to chapter 1, and let me tell you how it plays out. Here's what Isaiah then goes back into his land of unclean lips and tells his people. He tells them in verse 17, I'll start at the end of 16, stop doing wrong. And then here's what you can mark in your Bible. Verse 17, learn to do right. Wouldn't most problems, I don't care where they are, in our nation, in our government, in the economy, in your family, in our lives, wouldn't most problems dissipate and maybe possibly be solved if we all simply live by the do right rule? Learn to do right. Secondly, seek justice. That's exactly what Micah 6 and verse 8 says. See that everyone's treated fairly and rightly. Thirdly, encourage the oppressed. This is what he tells his people to go do. They haven't been doing this. That means we're called to help and encourage people who've been wrong, people who are carrying burdens, people whose lives are heavy, they have issues. We're to encourage them and help them. As God's people who've seen God, We've been there before, and we're to help them and encourage them. And we are, fifthly, to defend the cause of the fatherless and plead the cause of the widows. That's to speak up for those who have no voice, and that's pure religion according to our Lord's brother, isn't it? To step up and help them. Sadly, Israel doesn't listen to Isaiah's message from God. God says, but I love you. Come now, verse 18, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, if you'll just come and surrender. God wants to use them. He does not want their nation, the country of His chosen people, their lives to fall. He wants them to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God as they go about being salt and light and spreading forth His glory and echoing with the mountains and the beauty of the creation that God is God alone. And He's wanting his people to simply join him in that declaration and that word as they anticipate the coming of Jesus. It seems to me that's a message that needs to be heard today. And if you're here this morning and need to respond to Isaiah's message, which really is a call from God to you, then whatever your need may be or wherever you have been, the God of the heavens that we've sung about this morning, with outstretched arms is calling you to bring your life in total surrender to him and he'll hear and forgive and he'll use you for his glory if you need to come with us together we stand and sing